And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Megan is going to go ahead and um, record this webinar. That way it will be available after the fact as a recording. So don't feel like you need to quick write everything down that we go over today because you will get a link for the recording. Okay, so um, so again, um, I work for the Conservation District. And for um, those of you who don't know the Conservation District, um, we are a nationwide uh, grassroots organization dedicated to protecting and improving natural resources. Um, every county in Washington state has a conservation district. Um, we don't have regulatory power, so we only work with folks on a um, voluntary basis. All of our services are free of charge. Um, we do a very popular, popular annual native plant sale, which we just wrapped up. Um, which is a great way to find low cost native trees and shrubs to plant on your properties. We do a lot of work with horse and livestock owners. As you can see on this slide, we have some before and after photos um, where we provided some technical assistance to help folks dry up winter feeding areas, uh, which enables good manure collection. Um, we'll have a contact slide at the end where you can contact Megan or myself for more information, but we do make um, free site visits. So if you've got a problem that you're struggling with on your farm and you want some guidance, feel free to follow up with us. So with that, we're going to move into poultry keeping. So a lot of us start out and, and Megan and I both keep poultry or have kept poultry in the past. And we kind of start out with this dream of what it will be like to keep poultry. Um, and then reality hits. And so um, some of you might be brand new to keeping poultry, but it is amazing how something so small and so cute can be uh, so destructive on the land. So we're gonna talk in more detail later in this presentation about some tips and techniques that you can do to help keep your um, poultry yard from turning into a muddy mess. So um, we're going to go over this afternoon, um, kind of a, a rundown on chick care. We're going to talk uh, in more depth about um, poultry coops and houses and then outdoor yards and things that you need to consider like ventilation, nesting boxes, um, lights, heat source, um, perches, feed water, bedding. We're going to go into more detail, as I mentioned, about the outdoor pens and yards, talk briefly about drainage. And we're going to touch on some other poultry and waterfowl management and then kind of wrap things up with talking about um, manure and bedding management and composting. So for those of you who are starting out with young chicks, um, this is chick season, which is why we've timed this presentation for this time of year. Um, there's chicks available at most of the local feed stores um, throughout the county. You can also order chicks online. Um, they will come to you in a, um, in a box. It's the cutest box you'll ever receive. Um, but you need to have um, know some basics about keeping these young chicks um, happy. And they need to be kept warm. That's the main thing until they start to grow feathers. You need to set up a draft-free brooder pen with a lamp. You want to keep those pens around 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you're going to need to make sure that you have fresh um, chick starter feed and fresh water. Um, and it's really important to make sure that your pen, whatever container you're using, whether it's a feed tank or um, some sort of plywood enclosure, that it is protected from both wild and domestic predators. Um, use pine shavings or pellets for bedding. Don't use sawdust. It's too dusty. It can be a fire hazard and it can cause some respiratory problems for young birds. Um, and then do your best to keep that ble the bedding clean and dry to help reduce disease and illness and to just kind of cut back on, on some of the smell associated with that. So um, as I mentioned, it's pretty important to make sure that chicks are kept warm. Um, they, um, this is kind of just a quick diagram that Purina did. We thought this was great. That kind of shows you the just right. So, you know, take a peek in there, watch these young chicks, make sure that they're not huddled in the middle, which would probably mean they're too cold or that they're kind of scattered to the sides, trying to stay away, um, which would mean that they're too hot. So they should be happily moving about the tank. Um, and that if, if they look happy and they're eating and drinking, then you've got the temperature just right. Um, here's some options as far as um, pens that could work for brooders, um, kind of your classic stock tank setup, 
Um, and then a lot of folks, there's brooder pens that you can actually purchase at feed stores or handy or crafty folks can actually create um, a brooder pen. You want to make sure that you have appropriate waters and feeders. Chicks, young chicks can die, um, drown in just a tub of water. So make sure you offer a safe watering device so your chicks don't drown. And before you get off young chicks, can you touch sure. a medicated versus non-medicated feed and your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you know that it kind of comes down to a personal preference and the health of your um, chicks. Um, a lot of times the recommendation from the hatcheries are to start them on medicated feed. You have to realize that these chicks are kind of coming from mass production facilities where there are some bacteria um, and some disease um, concerns. And so starting them on the medicated feed will kind of help reduce some of those disease concerns. Um, plenty of folks opt want more of an organic start and opt not to use a medicated feed, which is a possibility as well. It really depends on the health of those chicks and where, you know, what sort of hatchery those chicks are coming from. Um, me personally, I do use a medicated feed for my um, brand new chicks, just kind of one bag to kind of get them going, just because I know they're coming. Um, the shipping process can be a bit traumatic and they can pick up some some infections that way. So it kind of comes down to a personal preference. Lots of people uh, have success with not using medicated feed, but um, it, it is designed to kind of help give those chicks an early um, boost on a good start in life. Great, thank you. Yeah, so as your chicks um, get older, you want to, and they'll start to feather out and you'll notice they'll start to grow. Their little soft down will start to mature into feathers. You want to slowly reduce the temperature in the brooder pen by about five degrees um, per week. Don't do this until you start to notice those feathers. You can switch their feed when they're about six weeks old from um, the chick feed to like a starter or grower feed. Um, you want to make sure that you continue to protect those um, young birds from both domestic and wild predators. And when you finally get to the um, point where you feel like your chicks are, are healthy, they're fully feathered, and they're ready to be introduced into your new flock, you need to um, you know, carefully watch and ensure that they're not getting beat on. Um, we've all heard of a, a pecking order and there will certainly be some, um, some scuffing and some feathers will fly, but you just wanna um, kind of let things work out, but do ensure that you, your young chicks are not being um, viciously attacked. Um, sometimes you know, folks will have better luck kind of introducing them, putting them into a pen next to the main chicken house so the other chickens could kind of meet them and get to know them and then slowly um, let them in the pen. Eventually they will figure it all out, um, but they do tend to kind of stick to their original groups. So you may notice as even mature birds will kind of stick to, um, to those original birds that they were brought up with. So with that, I'm going to move into um, more about actual poultry, chicken coops, chicken houses, and chicken yards. Megan, are there any other questions I should hit on before I move on? No, look, it's great. None. Okay, None. perfect. So there's kind of a variety of styles for, um, whoops, sorry about that, a variety of styles for how, for how you go about keeping poultry on your property. Um, you could do a permanent setup, which is typically just a, a coop or a shed with an attached outdoor pen. Um, a lot of folks opt for more of a portable setup, which is like a chicken tractor. I'll show you lots of examples. Some folks do more of a free range um, system, which kind of has its own advantages and disadvantages. And then a lot of folks do some sort of combination of the above options. So a permanent structure, um, it, like a, a hen house with an attached yard, that's going to provide safe and secure housing. Um, once you've installed it or um, kind of designated this chicken house, it's going to be minimal labor and it's going to be easier for other people to step in and take over the care of your birds if you should have to be ill or on vacation. So the cons are the initial cost investment. It can be quite expensive to get these houses set up correctly. It does require kind of routine maintenance to keep the um, structure in good shape and to keep the pens from turning to mud. And kind of what the other drawback if your birds are living permanently in a defined area is it doesn't provide a lot of fresh ground and insects and edibles that chickens and poultry prefer. 
So here's just some examples of more of a permanent style. So these are just different options for houses with um, stationary enclosures. So a portable approach would be, it's usually a bit more affordable. Um, you can move um, the whole system around your property, which is gonna help reduce mud and bare spots. It's gonna constantly provide them with fresh, um, fresh grass and insects and edibles. Um, it can be a little bit harder to keep your poultry safe in this sort of setup. Um, and it does become a little bit more of a challenge, especially during the winter to ensure that you have food and water available at all times to the birds. Um, and of course, there is more um, considerable labor and time involved with moving the pen around the property. So these are some options of some different portable structures. There's the electro net fencing. Um, which could be used. Um, I've seen this used successfully in a lot of pasture-based operations. You can see in the bottom lower left, it's quite remarkable how quickly chickens can overgraze or kind of remove all vegetation. So I would say if you're gonna go this route, you wanna be pretty consistent about moving the pens around. Um, of course, the, these birds are more susceptible to predators, um, especially um, you know hawks and eagles. Um, there's, you know, really no protection for them. You, you always want to provide some sort of um, shelter that they can quickly get under in case there is an eagle or a hawk or a raven attack. Um, so um, it, it can be a little bit tricky if you don't have help to move these fences without them becoming a tangled um, mess. So here's some other options as well. These are more portable style pens. These are kind of like your classic chicken tractors that you hear about. And these are designed to just be moved around the property. The top two really aren't gonna work for permanent structures during the winter months. Those are not gonna provide enough shelter and protection for your birds. Um, the bottom left one with the cute little turquoise doors, that one could be modified to provide year round housing. Um, but again, it's gonna be hard to keep uh, water there. It's gonna be hard to get power. We'll talk a little bit more about lights and um, heat and such. And then the bottom right is kind of your classic um, a uh, pen that is a hoop house style. It's um, fairly inexpensive and easy to make. Um, and it does work well for doing, especially brooders or broilers, if you're trying to just finish out birds quickly in six, eight weeks or so. Here's just a few other clever options I just wanted to share. Um, where folks kind of came up with a really good system, an old flatbed trailer that they've put more of a permanent style um, house on, um, old RVs that they've converted or pop-up trailers, an old horse trailer. So really um, the cool thing about birds is they're pretty adaptable. As long as you're providing them protection and food and water, they're pretty happy to just uh, make do with whatever you give them. Before you move on, Jen, I do sure. have one more question. Uh -huh. um, what do you recommend um, for hatch chicks, keeping them with mom or separate, um, you know, letting them hatch them out or what would you Yeah, um, well, I think that, the, you know, if you have a broody hen and she successfully hatches out a clutch, I think that's fabulous. Um, again, those, those chicks are very um, vulnerable to, um, to predators, to getting separated, to getting lost. So if you do have a broody hen and you have a way to, um, you know, if you notice she's broody and you want to let her go ahead and hatch out chicks, that's great. I mean, she's going to be um, much more efficient at caring for those young chicks than you are. She's going to do all the hard work for you, but you need to give her and those chicks kind of the best chance. And so I would say if you have a broody hen, set up kind of a brooding pen for her, an area where once she successfully um, uh, hatches her chicks, there's a safe enclosure where the chicks aren't going to be getting out or where things aren't going to be getting the chicks. Um, you know, broody hens are sometimes more vulnerable to other birds pecking at them. Um, if you've never dealt with a broody hen, usually the first thing people think is my hen's sick because she kind of just shuts down and her whole mission in life is to sit on that nest and to hatch eggs. So they kind of come off their feed, they come off water. Um, so it is kind of important to try to keep that area quiet and kind of leave her be and let her do her thing. But then once she does um, hatch out, um, you know, a clutch of chicks, you know, the best bet to get the majority of those up to um, adulthood is to have them in some sort of enclosure where they won't be taken by cats and eagles and hawks. Okay, any other questions before I move on to ventilation? Nope, we're good to go. All right. 
So these are great questions, by the way, keep them coming. So the um, one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that um, a good hen house or poultry enclosure has to have excellent ventilation. Um, poultry are constantly producing water vapor, ammonia and heat. So you need to keep these coops ventilated um, day and night, even in the summer, even through the winter. A good rule of thumb is to ensure that you have one square foot of ventilation per 10 square feet of coop space. Um, in cold climates, make sure that the vents are located high above the roosting point, and then making sure that snow can't cover up the ventilation. If you don't have good ventilation, you can end up with birds that have a lot of respiratory problems because uh, there, we'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about the uh, high nitrogen or ammonia content in their manure, and that can cause some real health issues if there's not good airflow and ventilation in a, in a hen house. So for those of you who are keeping poultry for egg production, um, there's a lot of variety out there too for nesting boxes. Um, I don't recommend using sawdust for the same reason as um, not keeping your chicks in sawdust. It, it can be very dusty. It can cause some problems in their eyes and their um, in their respiratory system. And it's, um, you know, can kind of congregate on um, the heat sources, which can be a fire hazard. Um, you do want to bed those nesting boxes with like hay or straw or chips or shavings. Um, do try to keep the boxes clean as possible. So clean them out every so often. You do want to elevate them off the ground, but also ensure that there's some sort of ramp or a step or something that they can hop up to get into the nesting boxes. And these are just some pictures of some clever upcycled options for um, for nesting boxes. I've successfully used old dresser drawers or old dressers. I love the bucket idea. It's very easy to clean out. Um, so, so yeah, lots of options out there for ensuring that your hens have a nice nesting box. Uh, Jen, can you touch really quick on what you think should be the kind of maximum height or the minimum height to have nesting boxes off the ground? Yeah, I think that they say, I think a bird that it kind of depends on the variety um, of, of bird that you have, but they can routinely hop up like 12 inches. So I'd say if you have a nesting box, that's like about a foot or a foot and a half off the ground, she should be able to fly or hop up there. Any higher than that, I would provide an access ramp or some sort of ledges so they can hop from ledge to ledge. Um, you know, just getting an old board and putting um, some, uh, some grip uh, like vertical pieces. I don't know if I have a picture of it, but basically building a ramp that has some traction, putting some old carpet on it or some pieces of wood um, will allow them to easily climb in and out of the boxes. But um, you don't want them to have to work too hard to fly in and out of the boxes. So anything that, you know, over a foot, foot and a half, I would provide some sort of ladder or ramp access for those birds. Great, thank you. The person said that answered it perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Good, good. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk just a bit about um, light. So if you have laying hens, they need about 12 hours of daylight to continue laying throughout the year. Um, you can kind of artificially create that by installing light bulbs. Um, most people, you know, will, um, you know, there's kind of different options, fluorescent, incandescent, as far as what you want to use. Um, I do recommend you use a warm wavelength bulb, which appears more of the yellow or orange or reddish color. This is more of a natural lighting and helps just stimulate that hen's reproductive cycle. Um, you don't need to use a super high wattage bulb. Usually like 24 to 40 watt bulbs will be sufficient. You can also use LED lights. Those work great too. Um, they are, there are glassless um, lights out there too that are great for um, use in poultry operations. You know, whatever you do as far as light, you just need to make sure you're protecting that um, bulb from the hens um, and that it's set on a timer. And so here's some just different options as far as um, controls out there. You can pick up these timers at any home improvement store. You don't, you don't wanna do a sudden change. You wanna kind of slowly increase supplemental lighting over a time period, you know, increasing 30 to 60 minutes each week. So you wanna to try to mimic as much as possible a, a normal um, day cycle of a 12 hours of um, light and 12 hours of dark. 
Um, ideally, they seem to do the best if the lights come on in the morning um, rather than extending the night. Um, and you do, again, for safety reasons, want to ensure that the bulbs and the cords and the timers are basically protected from the birds and are not accumulating in excess of dust and hay and straw, which can be a fire danger. So the next thing I wanna talk about briefly is just heating poultry houses. So this doesn't have to do with um, chicks or um, young birds. This is um, heating in a, um, for mature birds in a, in a poultry house. And so a lot of folks will hang a heat lamp. Um, the cool thing about birds and poultry is they are really adaptable to different climates. So it's likely that they don't even need an artificial heat source. I mean, some people just can't stomach the thought of their chickens being cold, so they will put a heat lamp up and that's fine, but you just need to be absolutely certain that that um, installation of the heating lamp is not going to cause a fire. I have lots of firefighter friends and even uh, friends I know that had barn fires and a lot of it has to, um, is originating from heat lamps and heat sources. So you need to be really careful and diligent if you're going to hang a heat source in your hen house. Um, I, would, I would suggest trying to utilize other things first to keep the hens warm, like good bedding. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but um, you know, be cautious if you go this route. So the other thing we need to consider if keeping our birds comfortable and happy are perches and roosts. So you should have um, perches and roosts for all your birds. They need to be a, a minimum of about a foot and a half off the ground. Um, it's ideal if it's multi-leveled -lev uh, and that each um, roost should be about two to four inches wide. Um, if you're trying to figure out how much space or how much roost area you need, um, each bird needs about, depending on their size, eight to 10 inches of horizontal space on that perch. So you want them to be able to sit and rest on the perch without rubbing shoulders with their friend next door. Um, wherever you place these roosts and perches, you're gonna have a lot of um, waste and manure that's gonna accumulate underneath there. So make sure you don't have them over your nesting boxes or your food and water source. This needs to be an area you can easily get in and clean. Um, and don't use metal or plastic, really wood is the best. Um, metal can be very cold um, and can cause some damage to their feet during the um, freezing weather and plastic can break down and cause some issues with their feet as well. So um, as far as feeding your birds, there's a lot of variation here depending on what sort of birds you have and what you're trying to do. Um, broilers, so those are meat birds that you're trying to finish out, are going to consume more feed in a shorter time period than like your hens. Of course, larger classes of poultry like turkeys and um, geese are going to eat a lot more than smaller um, classes of poultry like your average Rhode Island red or, um, or your average mallard. So, um, but in the winter time, you are going to need to supply more feed um, during the spring and summer months. Um, they'll just need more food to keep themselves warm. Um, again, go to the feed store, chat with the folks that work there, kind of just explain what sort of poultry you have and what you're looking to do. There's a lot of feed formulations out there that are, um, you know, they've done all the hard work for you and formulated out the complete feed that your birds need for your designated um, purpose. Um, I like to have just free choice feed available at all times. There's a couple of feeders over there on the right that show some different options. Um, you do need to provide scratch and grit, ideally on the ground. Um, and then the other thing that a lot of poultry owners deal with is rodent control. Because of course, whenever you have a food and a water source, um, that's kind of an ideal habitat for rats. And rats do like eggs, just like the rest of us. So you need to be pretty diligent about trying to keep these areas clean and trying to situate the food and water in more of an open area where um, rats and rodents will feel um, more insecure about accessing those areas. So um, this is kind of a no brainer, but you need to make sure you're providing fresh access to water at all times for your birds. You cannot just um, rely on snow or ice to hydration. They need to have liquid water available. 
Um, during the winter months, there's a variety of options out there for heated bowls or heated mounts, which will help fountains, which will help um, reduce ice problems. And you wanna be pretty diligent about keeping your water sources clean. Your birds are gonna be a lot healthier and productive if they have clean, fresh water rather than old, mucky water that's growing stuff. Um, I have a lot of those founts that the bottom red kind of half bowl and those you hard pipe in um, they are fabulous. They're kind of an on-demand water system and it's really easy to clean them out. You just kind of tip it to the side and swish it around and it cleans out. Um, so those are really um, great options for easy, clean, fresh water. Um, again, visit your local feed stores. Most of them will have all of these options available for you. So the next thing I want to talk about is the um, the bedding your hen house. So this is an interior. So sometimes it, in the bedding that would be in the floor of your coop or your shed. So um, there is a method out there that I've used pretty successfully and I've seen that used kind of throughout the county called the deep litter um, method, which is where you're using a lot of material on the floor of the coop, at least six inches of dry material. So old hay or, or dry straw. And then what you wanna do is you wanna go through periodically, take your um, pitchfork or your manure fork and fluff that top layer of the straw. And what that will do is that will kind of drop the manure and the droppings below and bring up the dry, fresh material. So this is an alternative to um, completely scraping the house out on a regular basis. So um, I've done this pretty successfully and, and just you know made it through winter. Um, of course, if you have a lot of birds confined in a small house, um, this won't work as well for you. But if you have you know a kind of an adequately sized house and not a plethora of birds, this is a really nice option. Um, you want to routinely keep adding some um, hay or dried straw to that top area. And then the more you fluff it, the better this system works. Um, these birds will be a lot happier if they have a dry, clean um, bedding in their house. And your house is going to, um, again, if it's well ventilated, is not going to have that really stinky ammonia chicken house smell. Um, you will need to completely clean this, all the bedding out and the manure out each spring. Um, you can compost that. We'll talk more in the presentation about composting it or give it away. Um, but you do need to at least clean it completely out once a year. So the benefits of this is it's going to help reduce odor. Um, it may actually help reduce flies. Um, it's going to make the coop much more attractive. Um, if you can keep the hen's feet clean, your eggs are going to stay a lot cleaner. Um, it gives the poultry kind of something to do. They'll dig around and fluff the bedding a little bit on their own as well. And it does save you a lot of work because you're not out there tossing all the bedding um, every week in your hen house. So with that, I want to kind of move and talk a little bit about outdoor um, coops and yards. And so um, I showed you that picture in the beginning of the presentation about how chickens can really be quite destructive and they can strip vegetation out of an area in no time at all. And so as soon as you get down to bare ground and then you add the rain that we get during our um, winter and spring months, um, you know, you kind of have the recipe there for a mud pit. And so if your birds are really messy, um, again, you know, her feet are covered with mud. She comes in, she covers the eggs in mud. Um, it lowers their body temperature to have them out in this kind of mucky footing, which is gonna make them more susceptible to um, infections, respiratory problems and foot disease. And then also these um, areas, if they're situated near a stream or a wetland or your own um, well, it can run off from these pens um, does have a lot of bacteria and nutrients like um, nitrogen, which can be um, pollution factors for nearby waterways and for your own drinking water. So these are all good reasons to try to tackle these muddy chicken pens. So the first thing you wanna think about um, is drainage. And if you're kind of dealing with an existing, um, you know, a hen house and you can't really move it, you kind of are working with what you have, 
first thing you want to do is the next time we have a big rainstorm, go out and take a look. Is there water running down a hill towards your hen house and your yard? And if so, um, use some sort of drainage to divert that clean water away from your poultry house and your chicken pen. So that's kind of your first step is just get out there, pay attention to what's happening when it's raining and try to get any excess water from heading that direction if you do. Um, just kind of that bottom picture is just an example of a um, curtain drain. A lot of times you, um, when you're putting in a, a, a structure, they'll excavate down. So then there's a slope. And then during kind of storm events or in the winter when our groundwater is rather high, we'll have uh, water running into these low areas. So you want to try to divert that water away from your um, from your hen house and your coop and your yard. And you know, if you can divert it just to a grassy unused area of, of your property, that's ideal. Um, the other thing you wanna take a look at is your house and if there's any, or your hen house, and if there's any roof runoff coming off of it. Even though these sheds and poultry houses are usually pretty small, um, just one inch of rain falling on a thousand square foot roof will produce 625 gallons of water. So think about where your farm or your property is situated and how many inches of rain that you're getting kind of over the winter months. And that's quite a bit of water that could be just shedding off of the roof. And that's clean water that we want to try to keep out of the um, of these muddy kind of manure filled pens. Um, and also will help you really dry up these outdoor yards. So here's just a few examples. We recommend that you do install gutters and downspouts on your um, hen houses and any buildings or barns that are adjacent to your poultry pens. Um, there's a couple examples here of diverting the, the roof water into a rain barrel or a cistern or a storage tank which is great, that's a great option, but I'm going to warn you that it will take no time whatsoever to fill up a 55 gallon barrel. So you need to have a, another plan for that excess water. And so um, we like to, um, there's something called a downspout diverter, which you can actually install in your downspout that will, um, that's on a float. So it'll fill up um, a rain barrel or a cistern. And then once that cistern is full, it'll trip the float and then it'll um, just go down the downspout and then out the outlet wherever you put it. You need to direct this water away from your hen house and you need to put it in again, either a dry well or a grassy unused area of your property. Um, again, Megan and I can help you with this. If you're struggling with trying to figure out what to do with the roof water and a muddy pen, let us know and we can help you out. Um, it is safe to use the water off of a metal roof for gardening um, or for watering the chickens, but we don't recommend that you collect water that will be used um, if you have a composite roof. So um, there are some issues um, with the material that they use to make the composite roof. So if you have a metal roof, you should be fine. If it's a composite roof, I would not use it for watering of animals or your garden. So to talk a bit more about reducing the mud in these poultry pens, you really have to plan to cover that bare native soil. As I mentioned, the chickens are gonna strip everything down out there. And so you're gonna have to come up with an option for covering that back up if you want to get rid of the mud. So um, there's a bunch of different options, footing options or base options. You could use crushed rock um, or hog fuel, which is large chipped wood shavings, straw, sand, and grass, but obviously grass is not gonna work for a permanent pen because they will eat it all in a matter of weeks. So if you have a pen that you're really struggling with a lot of mud issues, perhaps you've got poorly drained soils or it's a low lying area, um, we're gonna recommend that you actually um, use a gravel base in a pen like this. Um, and this is kind of the same technique as building like a hardened driveway. And the idea is you're gonna put in this hard base that's gonna raise the chickens up above the, um, the native soil, which is gonna get them kind of out of that muck and that mud. And then you're gonna um, have this hardened surface that you can then clean and keep your birds on that will be mud free. Um, so that's one option. That's kind of the Cadillac option to go the gravel pad route. Um, a lot of pens, can you can get away with just using something like hog fuel or large size wood chips. And the real um, kind of the advantages of this is that um, it can be long lasting. Um, you can kind of build up these pens to get your chickens up above the uh, wet, mucky, bare ground. 
and it tends to be fairly affordable. Um, you have to use a lot of material. So two to three times as much of the chips, so inches of chips as you have mud. I would plan on putting down, it sounds like a lot, but it'll kind of pack down. I would put at least a foot down to start with. Um, the cons is that you're going to need to scrape it out every so often that that it is a wood product so it's organic so it is going to um, decompose over time. Um, you know, it really depends on how big the area is and how many chickens you have in it, but I would for sure plan on having to at least scrape out a couple inches of the top inches and putting in a couple um, inches of fresh material each year. It does get a little challenge challenging to figure out what now what are you going to do with this kind of chicken manure and wood chip um, mix. And it does make a good mulch, but it will take a long time to compost because these are larger sizes of wood chips. So kind of keep that in mind that you have to figure out what you're going to do with that material. Another option for these outdoor pens are shavings. Um, again, the nice kind of um, thing about wood product is it binds up that nitrogen smell, which is going to help reduce kind of that odor in these outdoor pens. Um, the shavings will compost quicker than hog fuel, but then kind of the drawbacks are um, you, you need a lot of shavings to, to kind of cover up that bare ground. Uh, it can get kind of pricey um, and it, you know, it, it will blow away. It doesn't really hold up super well in like super wet pens. If you've got a lot of moisture already in your pen, um, shavings might not be your best bet. Here's just a couple examples. The hens and birds do seem to like the shavings. They'll, they, you know, will scratch and dig at them and stuff. And so it does make a good option, but um, I would say not for a pen that is really struggling with a lot of mud issues. So another option is a, for a base is like a straw or hay base. And so again, it's inexpensive, but fairly easy to spread out. It can help with reducer, um, reducing odor as well. And it does compost fairly easy. It's a smaller, lighter product. So it's gonna finish out and compost quicker. Um, again, probably not ideal for a really muddy pen or for an area where you're receiving significant rainfall. Um, it works good for like part of the year. It may still get muddy kind of in the dead of the winter. Another option is sand. Again, this is more of a permanent footing. Um, the, chicken, the chickens and poultry do like it for dusting, especially in the summer months where they're trying to get rid of bugs and they're hot. Um, it's a good option again for drained, um, for well-drained soil. And so um, but you do need to put down, you know, several inches of it if you want to actually have it control mud. Um, you will have to clean this material out on a pretty regular basis because you're going to have manure that kind of builds up in the sand. You're going to need to scrape out, again, the top couple um, inches. And it doesn't do a very good job with um, odor control as well. And depending on, um, you know, what's out there, it can be a little bit of uh, expensive as well. A uh, quick question, Jen. Um, are there any wood products that uh, you think shouldn't be used, such as cedar? Do you think cedar is okay to use? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that cedar is okay to use. Um, I have heard that there, you know, some birds are more susceptible to different wood products. And I will say that depending on what you get for hog fuel, um, you know, you need to be, if, if you order hog fuel, sometimes it's chipped building materials, which is not ideal because then you're going to have a lot of um, potential like nails and hardware and maybe some other products that are not safe. Um, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I, I want to say that um, there are some birds that are more susceptible um, to different wood products. So I could look up the cedar to see if that's a problem for birds. Um, or not, but yeah, I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. I'll try to look up an answer. Okay, yeah, thank you. I was just trying to remember, but one of my kids were telling me that there's one wood product, and I don't remember what they said that was less than ideal because some birds can have a reaction to it. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, um, so, um, so if you go the option of not wanting um, to have um, uh, kind of the, the permanent yards, then you can. Um, go ahead and, and use more of a um, rotational grazing. And so these are kind of the options. I talked a bit about this earlier. Um, it does provide um, 
fresh greens and such, but um, it is a problem as far as trying to keep the birds safe. So I wanted to chat just a bit about um, turkeys. Um, I know there's a lot of folks throughout the county that do keep turkeys. Um, you should not keep turkeys and chickens together um, because of a disease that can be passed between the birds called the blackhead disease. So ideally you would have a separate pens and houses. That being said, I've talked to a lot of farmers over the years that have said, I've always kept my chickens and turkeys together. It's never been a problem. Um, but I have heard stories where it has been a problem. So our general recommendation is that they are kept separately. Um, turkeys, again, are pretty hardy like chickens, depending on the breed. Um, they can handle cold weather once they reach uh, maturity. A lot of the heritage breeds um, will typically do better, um, you know, in more of an outdoor setting. Some of the meat birds are a little bit harder to keep. They just need, um, easy access to food and water and shelter. Um, you do need to offer roosts for your turkeys, just like your um, chickens, um, like two by fours work really well. Um, again, you wanna provide enough space to ensure that they have room to cover their feet um, so they're not getting frostbite during the winter months. And if you add corn to their diet, at least during the winter, that will help keep them warm. So for those of you who keep waterfowl, they kind of come with their own requirements. Um, again, they need a secure predator proof house. And just like um, chickens, they need to have good ventilation. And um, they don't roost at night. So they do need extra bedding in their house um, to keep their feet warm and keep them from getting frostbite during the winter months. Straw is great to put into their houses. Um, they need to constantly have access to fresh water at all times. So during the winter, make sure that their water source is thawed out. Um, most ducks and waterfowl rely on water for when they're feeding, for how they process their food. Um, because they're messy, just naturally, they're, they're obviously water loving creatures. Um, you know, they are notorious for making big messes. So um, using stall mats, um, kind of under their watering areas, or if you do like kitty pools or something for them during um, the summer months, you know, putting that on a gravel pad is, is ideal. So you're getting some drainage below that area. Um, they do not require swimming during the um, winter months, but it is ideal to provide them with some sort of water for swimming during the, um, during the warm months. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move to um, manure management. Megan, were there any other questions before I move on? Yeah, and this actually ties in. Um, this is a direct message, but I think it's an important one for everyone to hear the answer to. And it ties in, I think, with manure very well. Um, the question was, would you put the shavings that you cleaned out from the inside of your coop um, into the outside? Um, and so I think this ties in well with you know, the manure factor of that. So do you want to touch on that? Yeah, um, so, uh, so you can't, I mean, that is a possibility to kind of try to reuse shavings from the inside to the outside, but you have to keep in mind that especially the areas where the birds are roosting, you know, um, it, chickens, poultry, and um, turkeys, and waterfowl too, they generate an incredible amount of manure. So it could, it's likely that by moving that manure from the inside to the outside, you're going to kind of add to your mud problems. So if you feel like the bedding is fairly clean and you just want to put some fresh bedding down, then I think that would be okay. But if it's actually like a, 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 a manure accumulation in that bedding, I would caution you against that just because there's a lot of moisture in that manure and that's gonna not necessarily help dry up and clean up that outdoor pen. So I would kind of just take a closer look at it. And if it's if it's just um, slightly soil shavings, probably fine. But if there is manure in it, then I would say, no, that's, that's not a good plan. And I did look up the cedar shavings because I was trying to remember what it is. And it does say that cedar bedding is not safe to, for chickens um, due to some respiratory problems. So I would probably steer clear of cedar shavings. I know pine is widely accepted, but um, you know you may want to, especially for the indoor where they're kind of confined inside a house, definitely steer clear of the cedar shavings. 
So, um, okay, so moving on to manure, as I mentioned, um, you know, chickens produce per their body size quite a bit of manure. So one chicken's producing about a third a pound of manure per day. That's about eight to 11 pounds per month per bird. And again, that manure holds a, um, a, a lot of moisture, about 80%. So once it's dried, it dries down to a smaller amount, but while it's wet, it's gonna be, you know, have a lot of moisture content in it. Um, we've all heard how poultry manure or chicken manure is hot. And the reason it's considered hot is because that manure is very high in nitrogen um, and phosphorus. And um, usually our manure is not just straight chicken manure, it's also containing the bedding material or whatever litter that we're using in the bedding house in the hen uh, and in the nesting boxes. So if you look at this nutrient value of manures, this is just kind of some of our common livestock. And you can see um, this is in one ton of manure. So one ton of chicken manure or one ton of goat manure. So if you look at the nitrogen content, which is the N um, in chicken manure, 27.3 pounds of nitrogen per ton. That is why we say um, chicken manure is hot compared to maybe about 12 pounds per ton of nitrogen in horse manure. Um, again, the next column, P205, is phosphorus, so 23 and a half pounds of phosphorus. So again, much higher when compared to other classes of livestock um, animals. And potassium, um, again, hot, high, but not, you know, not as excessive as the nitrogen and phosphorus. So this is why how you handle the chicken manure and what you do with it is very important because you're dealing with, um, with waste that has a lot of nutrients in it. So we're recommending that you clean the houses um, frequently, especially in the nest boxes uh, or manure that's dropped under the roofs. Um, if you're using the deep bedding method, you know, you're, you're kind of fluffing that top layer and allowing the manure to drop out. So that manure you'd be cleaning out each spring. Um, you're going to want to pile up the manure and the, um, the messy um, bedding and whatever waste you're getting from your next nest boxes. Um, during the winter months, we recommend that you cover the manure pile with a tarp. This is especially important for chicken waste and manure because of the high nutrient content. Nitrogen moves um, with water. So as soon as it rains on like a manure pile with a lot of chicken manure, wherever that runoff is running, there goes all your nutrients. And you want those nutrients for your gardening endeavors or for improving pastures. Um, and those nutrients running off, if it's getting into groundwater or into nearby surface water, can cause a lot of pollution problems um, for those waterways. It's pretty important to ensure that you have a grassy filter strip around your manure pile that will help um, take up those nutrients that are flowing off of the pile. You want to make sure you don't have any runoff. Again, think back to that photo of a um, kind of seasonal water flowing downhill. You want to put your manure pile in a high and dry area that's at least 100 feet from wells further if you have a big slope or minimal vegetation. And you know you should consider storing manure, um, especially chicken manure on a concrete slab if you have it, especially if you live on well-drained soils and especially if you have a well on your property. If you have well-drained soils, then you are going to leach those nutrients down into the groundwater. And especially if you're relying on that groundwater for your own potable water, that could be a concern. So we do recommend that you compost um, poultry manure before using it. And you're kind of already setting yourself up for successful composting by using straw and hay and shavings um, in your nesting boxes and in your hen houses. Um, you want to ensure that the composting process is complete before using this. And we'll talk a little bit more in the next couple slides about composting. But it's pretty important to ensure that you go through that entire composting process, especially if you're feeding your chickens um, table scraps and, and uh, meat scraps. A uh, question, Jen. Sure. Do manure piles attract rodents? Yes, manure piles can attract rodents if there is a, if there's wasted feed in that pile. Sometimes you'll end up with problems with rats and mice coming into that pile, scratching around, digging around for corn and other wasted chicken feed. So try to do a good job of keeping your feed, um, keeping your 
poultry feed from kind of mixing in with that manure and wasting a lot of feed because that can be an attractant for rodents. So I, I think too that sometimes as the composting process is taking place, um, those piles are um, releasing heat. And so I think sometimes it's just a nice little habitat for rodents and rats. So yes, that can be a concern, especially if you're adding food scraps to your kind of chicken compost pile, um, you will you know, definitely be kind of luring in rodents and rats that are looking for a free and easy food source. Um, things to do to discourage that, again, some of the, you know, trapping, um, sometimes just where you're placing the pile can make a difference. If there's, you know, like a vegetated area or some trees or something where the rat, rats and rodents don't like to be out in the open and exposed. So if they have to travel across kind of an exposed area, they typically won't take that risk. So trying to just reduce the habitat around both your hen houses and your compost pile will hopefully help discourage them from kind of taking that risk of running across an open area to get to some food. Um, so composting basics. Um, so um, compost is just kind of like taking care of chickens. There are little microorganisms, more microorganisms that live in the manure that need things just like your pets need. They need oxygen, um, moisture, they need food. Um, and so um, carbon and nitrogen. And this is where we talk about a carbon to nitrogen ratio. The correct carbon to nitrogen ratio is 30 parts of carbon per one part nitrogen. So again, think about the fact that this has a, a high level of nitrogen in it. So you're going to need to add a lot of dry material. And so your dry material is old hay, is straw, is shavings, and you're going to need to, you know, make sure that your pile has a good carbon source in it in order to kind of get this ratio correct. If you, if you're wondering, do I have it correct? Well, if you stick a shovel in there and kind of wiggle it around and you see, you know, smoke kind of billowing out and you, you, it feels hot in the interior part of the pile, then you are doing it correct. So if composting is happening, the pile will heat up, it will cook down in size, you will get temperatures of 120 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit in that pile, which will help kill any parasites or fly eggs or weed seeds that happen to be in there. It takes about six to eight weeks during kind of the spring and summer months to finish compost. A lot of this depends on your willingness to go out there and manage your compost pile. The more often you can turn it, the, um, the quicker it will finish out. Sometimes just even inserting PVC pipes that have drilled holes in it to help facilitate airflow, that will really help too. And you also want to ensure that this pile is not getting either too dry during the summer months or too wet during the rainy season. You want the material about as wet as a rug out sponge. So again, in order to achieve this, it's really helpful to cover it with a tarp that will help keep it from getting too dry in the summer months. You probably will need to actually add a bit of water in the summer months. And then also it'll help keep your pile from getting too wet during the winter months. If it gets too wet, it goes anaerobic, it starts to smell really bad and it won't actually compost. So um, benefits of composting, it's going to reduce the overall volume that you're dealing with by about half. It's going to kill those parasites um, and weed seeds, reduce odor, and it's going to make more of a stable, slow-release product that you can then safely use in your gardens and on your fruit trees, on your pastures, or on your, on your lawn. Here's just some options. Um, you know, this is kind of large scale and small backyard scale for composting. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be fancy. You can see the wood pallet bins down there. Basically just a designated space where you can kind of be loading um, the fresh manure and waste you're pulling out of the poultry house while you're kind of finishing the compost and then a bin for, you know, compost that's finished and ready to get used out on the garden. Again, keeping it covered is really the key um, in managing this uh, chicken manure and chicken waste. So with that, um, again, I mentioned at the beginning that um, we're available to help make site visits. So, you know, please contact us. You, we have a lot of information on our website. There will be a recording of this available after the fact. And um, with that, I know that was a lot of information quickly, but with that, we have, um, you know, five or so minutes that we can take some questions if there's questions that I did not get to. Yes, we did have one. Okay. Do you think there's a benefit to feeding corn or not feeding corn? 
Um, I think that there is a benefit during the winter months to feeding corn, especially to turkeys. It, it will help keep them warm. Um, I mean, I would say all classes of poultry do enjoy corn. And so it kind of depends on if your birds just seem like they're not doing really well, they just seem cold, or they're not maybe laying as well or growing as well. I think adding corn as an energy source is an, is an okay option. Um, I do think a lot of the um, formulated feeds specific for like broilers, if you're trying to finish meat birds or for laying hens, those are complete feeds that should have everything the bird needs really to survive and thrive. So, you know, you might not you need to add corn in that situation. If you're feeding more of like an all stock or some kind of just generic grain and your birds just don't look great, then I think adding corn can just, you know, boost a little bit of extra energy and, and a little extra health for them. So a complete feed should have everything they need, but I think adding corn is not a bad idea, but I would certainly add it if your birds are looking great. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions. Way to stay within the time limit. Okay. Well, um, yeah, well, thank you. And then if anybody has questions after the fact, you know, feel free, you'll, you'll be, you should have got an email from me with this um, meeting link. So feel free to respond to that and I can try to get you um, answers to your questions as well. And yeah, thanks for carving a little bit of time out this afternoon to spend with us and good luck to all your poultry keeping endeavors. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yep.